So hello guys, welcome to the Parson series and this is part 5 of the UVL tract. So if you remember last time we were talking about the amazing concepts of the uveitis related to the tuberculosis and the leprosy and today we are going to start with the spirochetal uveitis. So I think in this list the topmost will always be syphilis so let's get started. Now again a very very important thing as we had read this in the tuberculosis also that syphilis can attack any part of the uveal tract a uh, very very important line. Now, if you look at the clinical manifestations of the infection, uh, these are actually the protein and they are partly due to the direct organism invasion and partly due to the modulation of the immune system. And in this immune system, we have both cell mediated as well as your humoral immunity. So whenever they are asking you a question, maybe uh, related to medicine, related to microbiology and ophthalmology, these are the aspects that could be asked of that it can affect any part of the uveal tract. Then if you look at uh, the manifestations, they are due to the direct invasion also. They are due to the modulation of immune system also, both cell mediated immunity as well as humoral immunity. Are you uh, understanding what are the things that could be asked? So if you look here, the eyes can be affected in any stage of the syphilis. So it can be any part of the eye and any stage of the syphilis in various ways which are affecting the conjunctiva, cornea, sclera, uvea, optic nerve as well as the central nervous system and that is the reason that this syphilis has been recognized to be a great masquerader because you know when a single disease is actually affecting so many organs the presentations can be very much varied and therefore so many things could be mimicking the other syndromes that is why we are calling it as the masquerader uh, penicillin did control the rampant prevalence of this infection in the past but if you look in the present the incidence of this um, disease has shown drastic increase in the recent years uh, in the concurrence with the HIV infection. So due to the immune modulation, especially by the HIV infection, we have number of in, uh, cases that has been increased in the syphilis. So not only is it recommended that the test for both HIV and syphilis be performed if the patient is found either to be positive. Again, a very important thing when you are getting a question, you know, that which of the following uh, are true. So uh, especially in the INICT when you are uh, multiple answers could be right. So this person who is having HIV positivity can be having the positivity for syphilis also and it could be other way around also but it is also recommended that you should have a high index of suspicion in all the high risk cases because of unusual clinical signs are noticed in the concurrent HIV infection and uh, this kind of a uh, syphilis where we are uh, the patient is already already having the HIV or also having the HIV is actually fulminant one and slower to respond to the treatment so you have to really be very very cautious okay so let's get started with the syphilitic iritis so we have syphilitic iritis also we had tubercular iritis also and then this is syphilitic iritis then we were having the lepromatous uh, leprosy also having the iritis so this syphilitic iritis is actually manifesting in two forms one is your non-specific one this is either iritis or it could be iridocyclitis also and like other granulomatous uh, diseases it could be both granulomatous or non-granulomatous which is occurring typically in the secondary stage of the disease. Now though it can occur in any stage of the disease but it is especially in the secondary stage of the disease that is soon after your skin eruptions and uh, usually within the first year of infection. Again these are the things that will help you in solving the clinical case scenarios. They can give you a patient having the iritis, some non-specific features of iritis or the iridocyclitis. Maybe uh, they have given you certain features of secondary stage of the syphilis in the first year and uh, not before the third month. This is again a very, very important thing. It is not occurring before the third month. Now in light color iritis, okay. In the light color iridis, prominent dilated uh, iris vessels termed roseola, these are due to the triponemal emboli causing the local vasoconstriction. So uh, whenever we are having certain signs related to the iris, you should know about them. 
uh, like we have lullish nodules, we have got the iris pearls, we have brush wheel spots, we have koiper nodules, we have buzaka nodules and then we have got the fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis, we have a heterochromia, lighter color iris. Now this is another thing where you are having a lighter color iris and you can also have the roseolas. Uh, another important thing is your posterior sinaiki, which are found between the iris and the lens. So, iritis is actually lasting for two to eight weeks here. Does not usually, it's not reoccurring. That's a very important and, and a good aspect of it. In the absence of the early antisyphilitic treatment, but if you are not giving this treatment, it is seen that at least three to four percent of the syphilitics, usually the males, and um, you know, in unilateral, the other eye can get affected. And you can have this um, treponema which is present in the aqueous. So this uh, presence of the treponema in the aqueous I think is a, again an important statement and you should always take into consideration of this. Then uh, so many people always ask me what is plastic iritis. That is the uh, presence of the fibrinous exudates over the iris. So this is actually your plastic iritis that also occurs in congenital syphilis as an accompaniment of the interstitial keratitis. It also occurs in the young babies with the congenital syphilis. And important thing is that you do not have any corneal complications. So you are having, you know, large nodules. You can have the uh, gometas on the iris. You can have the nodules, but you are um, uh, having this fibrinous exudates, uh, especially in these people of congenital syphilis. And uh, the important thing is that they do not have any corneal complication. And that is again a good thing, I, I th suppose, uh, as far as the prognosis is concerned, because uh, it is the corneal involvement that will lead to the diminution of vision. Okay. Now, the finally, uh, there is also a plastic iritis, acute plastic iritis that can also occur a jarish hulk zemer reaction, which is 24 to 48 hours after the first penicillin due to the flooding of the system with the treponemal um, toxins. So, plastic iritis can actually take place in these cases due to the multiple reasons. Okay. Now, uh, we are heading towards the gometous iritis. So, this gometous iritis is actually occurring late in the secondary or uh, rarely it is during the tertiary stage if they are asking typically about the stages where it is found. And uh, what is actually gumma? It is actually the formation of a yellowish red heavily vascularized nodule near the pupillary or the ciliary border of the iris. So if you remember what was the structure of the iris and then we will be able to consider it. So this was your structure of the iris and this is your pupillary border. So we are having the yellowish or reddish nodules and why it is reddish because it is heavily vascularized and gometa means a large one, okay, and uh, they are they can be multiple also. So if you use a reddish color or maybe yellowish color, so I am using a bit of that, okay, so orangish color is there. So we are having some of this. We are having this yellowish nodules. They are actually multiple, varying in the size and they are present anywhere over the iris. So they are actually present and um, they are usually present late in the secondary or rarely they could be in the tertiary stage also. So you have to remember that these are actually associated with the exudation and the broad synecy. Then uh, there is a condition, um, we have syphilitic choroiditis and chorioretinitis. So we had iritis and now we are coming towards the choroiditis or chorioretinitis which can occur as a part of disseminated choroiditis, peripheral choroiditis, diffuse choroiditis, uh, it could be a pseudoretinitis, pigmentosa, neuroretinitis, big blind spot syndrome and exudative maculopathy, uveal effusion, vasculitis, central retinal venous occlusion, retinal necrosis and in HIV infected people, lesions resembling the placoid, pigment, epitheliopathy and atypical serpiginous choridopathy. So there is a lot of you know manifestations where you can find the syphilic choroiditis as well as chorioretinitis. If you look at here, we can have a disseminated choroiditis also, we can have a peripheral uh, choroiditis, a diffuse one, uh, sometimes it is presenting in the form of a pseudoretinitis, pigmentosa, we can have neuroretinitis that will be your optic neuritis kind of thing, we can have uveal effusions, we can have CRVO, necrosis, so again, uh, you know, a masquerading kind of things is there. And uh, there are 
so many things which can mimic it. So again, it's important. So if you look at the differential diagnosis of this syphilitic uveitis, it could be tuberculosis, sarcoidosis, autoimmune uveitis, serpiginous choroidopathy, acute posterior placoid, pigment epitheliopathy. So how to make that diagnosis? You are having so many things in the differential diagnosis. How to make sure that, that this is actually syphilis? Again, this could be the question that is asked in the clinical scenario to you. So how to approach this question? They will say that uh, this diagnosis can be established. Either you can do the direct demonstration of the organism. Now direct uh, demonstration of the organism, you know your microbiology. You can do it from direct microscopy also or you can use your direct fluorescent antibody with high specificity test okay and of course second is your serology so if i want to uh, diagnose the syphilis uh, either i can see that triponema directly demonstration of the organism or i can do it titers now the triponema tests uh, if i am doing they are actually more specific and they are used to confirm the diagnosis after a positive screening test and they are used to detect late latent and tertiary syphilis we can do it now, it is mandatory in any case of ocular syphilis, um, if you are having any case of ocular syphilis with a positive serological test, that you look for the evidence of the neurosyphilis. And that you can do with the help of CS examination, CSF examination, right? Now, um, in the CSF, what you are going to get? So, in the CSF, I can have the leukocytosis, elevated protein concentration, positive CSF VDRL test are confirmatory evidence of neurosyphilis. So, again, you know, uh, they are giving you certain statements that, that could be directly picked up in the form of a question. Patients who are having concurrent HIV infection. So, if I have certain patients who are also having the concurrent HIV infection, they could be diagnostic challenge as in such cases, they could be, you know, both types of serology is unreliable. And it's very, very uh, common to have syphilis and HIV both positive. So, that becomes a diagnostic a dilemma. Now, if you look at the treatment, uh, you have to uh, give penicillin in all these stages. So, that is not a problem. I don't have to, you know, judge the stage to start the penicillin. And those with the early syphilis, uh, that is, you can go with the primary, secondary, or the latent syphilis, all less than one year, they are treated with a single intramuscular injection of benzathine penicillin or your benzyl penicillin. And um, those people who are your immunocompetent individuals who are having more than one year duration, they are treated uh, with the intramuscular injections weekly for up to three weeks. All right. So all patients with ocular syphilis, it's very, very important. And again, they have repeated the same uh, sentence that if the patient is having ocular syphilis, never forget to rule out the neurosyphilis. And for that, you have to do the CSF examination. CSF may, you have to look for the leukocytosis, increase CSR, um, CSF protein concentration, as well as CSF VDRL positive test. And uh, if you are um, finding it positive, you have to give the neurosyphilitic therapeutic doses, which are actually different. They are the intravenous aquaspensilin, and this is given two to three mega units every four hours for 14 days. Then if you are having a congenital syphilis, then this is treated with the aquaspensilin G or procaine pencilin G uh, given for 14 days. It must be remembered that syphilitic infection is more severe and has a faster progression in patients known to be HIV positive and HIV infected. So obviously that we know that in all those patients who are also HIV positive in those people, this is more severe and progression is really going to be very, very uh, uh, virulent and fulminant. So the treatment should also be according to that only. As far as the investigations in the treatment path is concerned, uh, this is a benefit for you guys because you are studying the syphilis both in microbiology, in medicine. So you are already aware of its diagnostic as well as therapeutic regimen. So this is just a, you know, a rapid revision kind of a thing. And the another benefit is that when you are studying their syphilis, uh, maybe in microbiology or in medicine, then you always remember that yes, we were we were also studying this in same in the Parsons, and uh, you know there there will be ophthalmology revision, and here there will be your micro and medicine revision. Yeah, okay. So come to the leptospirosis. So if you are having an infection with the spirochete uh, leptospira, so this is occurring either by contact or uh, it could be waterborne ingestion of the water contaminated uh, which is uh, which is contaminated with the urine of infected domestic and the wild animals 
uh, cats, pigs, dogs and rodents. It's a natural host and uh, actually the human is just the accidental host. So uh, if by, by chance a uh, patient is, uh, you know, ingesting the contaminated water, then that could be a scenario where man is acting as a host there. People in the developing countries who are swimming, who are bathing and working in the contaminated water or we have got, you know, veterinarians, farmers, they are always at a high risk. So these uh, three people, kinds of people are actually at a high risk for the leptospirosis. Um, it is always giving you non-specific symptoms like headache, fever, malaise. They are very, very common. And uveitis is just up to 10% and usually you have a hypopion. So um, if you look at the diagnosis, that is pretty simple. You have to go for the antibody test. So you can do anti-leptospira antibody test and um, you can uh, do it in, in the blood sample. And uh, we can also do the culture for the live organisms. Treatment uh, is again topical steroids and cycloplegics in conjunction with the intravenous penicillin in severe infections and oral doxycycline. So if you look at the treatment, nothing new. You have to uh, actually combine your uh, ocular treatment along with the systemic treatment. And uh, for the ocular treatment, of course, we have to give the steroids, we have to give the cycloplegics and you have to combine it with the systemic penicillin. Now, another important thing is your viral uveitis. What if the patient is having uveitis due to the viral infections? So there are certain important viral infections that can cause uh, the chorioretinitis or the retinitis. And these infections are CMV, herpes, rubiola, rubella, influenza, Epstein-Barr virus and herpes B from monkey bites or scratches. So whenever we are thinking of uveitis due to the virus, first think of these viruses. So uh, let us start with the acute retinal necrosis. What is this acute retinal necrosis? This is nothing but just a severe posterior uveitis, which is actually caused by varicella zoster virus or it is herpes simplex virus, both one and two. So whenever, you know, viral infections come into being, I think these are the first viruses that are, um, you know, remembered herpes simplex and herpes zoster. So they are the same one. We have a varicella zoster virus. We have herpes simplex virus, both one and two causing the posterior uveitis. And uh, that is called as acute retinal necrosis. And the specific clinical entity is actually called as the progressive outer retinal necrosis, PON, right? This is caused by the same viruses. Now, it is seen in the patients who are immunocompromised. So, basically, it's not occurring in all people. All those people who are basically immunocompromised, maybe having HIV, maybe having some immunosuppressive drugs, or maybe having immunosuppression due to any, uh, you know, reason, A to Z, they are the people who can have this. So, uh, it could be, you know, herpes zoster which is demonstrated to be responsible based on the electron microscopy or PCR reports. So how we are able to uh, find them, we can find out this herpes zoster with the help of electron microscopy with the help of the PCR. Now what is the basic difference between the two? The basic difference between the two is actually the propensity of this progressive outer retinal necrosis to affect the posterior pole and outer retinal layers. So how do you get to know why it is called as outer? So this word outer means that it is affecting the outer layers of the retina. That is why it is outer retinal necrosis, basically the posterior pole and the outer retinal layers. And you have very, very few intraocular inflammatory signs in the form of vitritis, retinitis, vasculitis. And uh, we have got more of, you know, fulminant. It uh, gives you more fulminant retinal destruction as compared to this ARN. So if you look at this uh, acute retinal necrosis, it is starting from the periphery. So when this starts in the periphery and slowly and gradually it is involving whole of the layers, that is why it is called as necrosis. Necrosis means that whole of the layers are involved. So slowly and gradually, you know, it starts in the periphery over days or weeks. It involves the full thickness of the retina leading to the necrosis and a type of RD also. Which RD? RRD. So, you know, when we um, learn about the risk factors of RRD, I think this is also one of the risk factors which can be, you know, coming in the form of a new 
uh, point to us. The condition is actually uh, bilateral in certain number of the cases you see, which is a large number. 80% of the cases we have bilateral and in most of the cases, the fellow eye involvement occurs within three months. So again, this could be a question that a person is coming, is HIV positive, we have involvement and then uh, when can we expect the involvement of the other eye? So it is less than three months. The main DD, if you see here, we have got the cytomegalovirus, we have got HIV, Toxoplasmosis, syphilis, immunological disorders like Bechet syndrome and certain malignancies like we have ocular large cell lymphomas. Uh, coming to the diagnosis, a definitive diagnosis you can do if you are able to isolate these viruses. It could be a varicella zoster virus, a herpes simplex virus or we are doing the serotitis conversions. We can see histopathological examination of the biopsies or uh, you can uh, test the ocular fluids. Uh, especially the vitreous, you can do the uh, PCR. So if you look at uh, the investigation part, main in uh, terms of the ophthalmology, you have the uh, PCR of the fluids and we have got two main fluids. One is aqueous and one, of, and one is the vitreous. We can do that. Uh, treatment is same. You have to give the, uh, the antivirals, intravenous acyclovir can arrest, retinal detachment ke liye obviously will do the surgical therapy so this one was your um, ARN now uh, CMV I think everybody knows CMV in terms of HIV only so let's talk about it so again this CMV is actually occurring in those patients who are immunocompromised and that is why most common is the AIDS patient so what is the most common infection that can occur as an opportunistic infection in eye those people who are having the HIV so that is your CMV retinitis. Most common manifestation is the CMV retinitis that is characterized by grayish patches or you have got the multiple white dots. That's why, you know, uh, we can have uh, it in a part of multiple white dot syndrome also. Irregular sheathing could be there. We can have vitreous clouding and uh, you can have so many hemorrhages there along with healing and then we have atrophy. And uh, this is also common. Now, HIV was the most common one, but otherwise you can also found this in the renal transplant patients. And uh, it can produce also acute cytomegalic necrotizing retinitis with irreversible damage and the loss of vision. So what you're going to give in these patients, those patients who are immunocompromised, maybe HIV positive. So we can give the Gen Cyclovir. Gen Cyclovir is effective in controlling this infection and uh, it requires an indefinite maintenance therapy you have to give. So again, uh, we'll be covering uh, the chapter, the ocular therapeutics and the lasers. They will be dealing this in detail. The average rate of survival of the AIDS patients has improved significantly um, since the introduction of the highly active antiretroviral therapy. And uh, also that is why the incidence of CMV retinitis is also decreased. Uh, we have also the implants available. Implants are gencyclovir implants, slow release. They can be inserted into the eye. And uh, we can actually insert these implants into the sclera and we can suture them. And slowly the drug will be released from this. And uh, actually it remains suspended in the vitreous cavity. We are suturing it to the sclera and it remains suspended in the vitreous cavity. And uh, if they are not available, then the infection can be curtailed by the repeated intravitreal injection of gencyclovir. Sometimes we do not have these implants, then repeated injections. Uh, what if it is occurring in the children? So if it is occurring in the children, infantile cytomegalovirus infection, then this will lead to the severe brain damage with the mental deficiency. So children are, um, you know, already weak. So we can even have the mental involvement there. And the ocular lesion actually varies. Ocular lesion vary karega. From the isolated, it could be a central retinal lesion to a chorioretinitis with much disorganization of the group. The next one is the measles. Uh, measles may, especially when I'm talking about the acute phase of the infection, visual impairment may be noted with a residual pigmentary retinal disturbance. Uh, especially the cases, you know, uh, these are rare, but they are very important and worth mentioning. Those patients who are developing the subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, there we have a permanent loss of vision and we also have the pigmentary changes. Now, now are days when we can have the integrated question and when they are you know, uh, laying so much of um, importance and, you know, uh, there is a pronounced 
uh, heading that we have an integration or vertical as well as horizontal integration and we'll be asking questions now i think it's important to see every aspect of ophthalmology that is why i will say that these things are again important because when they're asking you question maybe related to measles now measles i cannot say it is just you know infectious disease this infectious disease is obviously covered under infectious diseases we are also talking it under uh, pediatrics under vaccinations so so there are so many things which we are talking uh, measles with respect to so this is one of the emergency subacute sclerosing paroncephalitis and um, you can have the the permanent loss of vision and finally they may end up in asking the uh, ocular complication there this uh, is also presenting as uh, the central neuroretinitis or porioretinitis after having several attacks of the measles. Mm, now it is possible that this uh, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis uh, is a slow virus infection in which acute phase of the measles is also uh, followed by the persistence of the virus. So when this virus is actually persisting maybe in the brain and the retina then they are causing the gradual destruction of the neuronal cells and that is why we have this neuroretinitis there all right coming to the fungal uveitis now uh, if i talk about the fungal uveitis first come to the exogenous fungal uveitis we have a lot of fungi and especially when we have a penetrating trauma with it could be any vegetative matter or we can have any intraocular surgery and uh, these uh, fungi can be gaining the uh, entry inside the eyeball and then we can also can have the androgenous fungal uveitis obviously by the hematogenous spread now fungal uveitis if i it is occurring by the candida so fungal uveitis by the candida is an example of the opportunistic pathogen on the mucous membrane especially in the immunocompromised individuals when we have hiv we have pregnancy all these things chorioretinitis infiltration in the vitreous obviously could be there from hematogenous spread also so treatment is same treatment will be the same you have got the intravitreal antifungals uh, uh, like amphotericin b we have voriconazole and then we have pars plena vitrectomy for those cases who are not responding to the systemic treatment i think candida though we are studying a whole about it and a lot of questions also come about candida so you can remember the treatment there also now another important thing is your histoplasma capsulatum histoplasma capsulatum can again affect the eye of a healthy individual in a characteristic syndrome called as the ocular histoplasmosis syndrome again immunocompromised patients it can occur as a isolated choroidal granuloma or it can present as a case of endophthalmitis also the diagnosis is made clinically on the features and the histopathological examination of the specimen again this is a thing which is more you know from the systemic type but because of its ocular involvement it has been discussed here so the treatment is actually the intravenous amphotericin b and uh, this uh, epidemiologically obviously it is related to histoplasma capsulatum infection uh, what are the things that you are going to get you are going to get choroidal new vascular membrane you are going to get the disiform lesions and uh, these lesions are very very well circumscribed i will be showing you the figures also and uh, we are not having any uh, specific inflammatory signs in the aqueous or the vitreous we also have a atrophy very papillary pigment atrophy that is a very very characteristic feature in the young people and we can have a bilateral central visual loss so two things are very very important here one is your ocular histoplasmosis syndrome and the bilateral central vision loss could be there in these cases here you can see in the diagram this is the histoplasmosis of the macula where you can see the choroidal neovascular membranes uh, we can have the asymptomatic membranes also so if i am having the asymptomatic choroidal neovascular membranes or those you know which do not threaten these macular area so uh, the comparatively which are milder ones you can you know leave them to heal spontaneously but yes if the vision is threatened then what is the treatment you are going to give the laser ablation or intravitreal injection of anti vegf agent so another you can say it's a indication it is a indication of anti vegf agents we have studied the usage of anti vegf agents um, at so many places in the retina so this is another indication the treatment of extra foveal neovascular membranes extra foveal when we are saying that at least 200 microns away uh, that will be most rewarding but obviously those which are near the fovea 
near the phobia means which are lesser than 200 so 1 to 199 these are your juxtaphobial juxtaphobials are also amenable to laser treatment but they have a poorer prognosis and uh, here they are saying that uh, uh, they are amenable to laser treatment but usually we avoid the laser treatment giving near the phobia Finally, we come to the parasitic uveitis. So, first one is our toxoplasmosis. This is a protozoan infection and we all know that this is coming from the cats. Cats is the main host and uh, it is actually the oocytes of the toxoplasma that is actually affecting the retina and uh, then it is the choroiditis that is occurring secondary. So, typically when we have the toxoplasmosis, uh, we have granulomatous panuveitis. Yes or no? We have got the granulomatous pan uveitis but out of this pan uveitis it is actually this choroiditis that is your posterior uveitis this is your posterior uveitis which is the most common presentation and in India actually it is the most common cause of posterior uveitis or chorioretinitis also all right so in infants let us see in infants because you know that toxoplasmosis can occur in two forms we can have congenital toxoplasmosis we can have required also so in infants in whom the infection is actually acquired transplacentally the ocular infection is very severe we have encephalitis you know and uh, the retinal picture is very very characteristic with bilateral frequent chorioretinal lesions in the fundus and um, we always know that the macular involvement is quite early in the cases of toxoplasmosis due to which we have the early vision loss the entire retinal thickness can be involved, entire choroidal thickness can be involved and that is why we have necrotizing inflammation, we have punched out areas and um, because you know the whole of the area is so punched out, it looks as if there is an absence of tissue there and due to that absence of the tissues, the DD becomes your congenital coloboma. So many a times you know they can give this that there is a congenital coloboma in the um, patient but uh, maybe you are not having actually that you are having a case of toxoplasmosis. Uh, there will be changes in the meninges also and if you remember what was the typical triad of congenital toxoplasmosis what was the typical triad of the congenital toxoplasmosis one was your hydrocephalus and uh, due to this hydrocephalus we have the convulsions hydrocephalus is there number two we have the intracranial calcification intracranial calcification is there and number three, we have got the chorio, chorioretinitis. We also have the chorioretinitis. These three things are there. So you have to remember that. In adults, if I am talking, right? So in adults, it is constituting one of the more common causes of retinochoroiditis. And here you are having a widespread infection. We have recurrent attacks and a lot of exudation in the vitreous cavity is there. You can uh, look by the endocyanin green angiography for the choroidal lesions. It's always better. And uh, if I am talking about the pathological aspect. So in pathologically, the areas which are found, these are the areas of the necrosis where you can find the parasites and uh, diagnosis of course depends upon the serology so what are the tests we can do in the serology the sabin feldman dye test with the titer greater than 1 by 16 the complement fixation test endocyanin uh, sorry the indirect hemagglutination test elisa test for ic igg and igm so all these tests we can do for the toxoplasmosis again you already know this from your other subjects and um, if you look at the treatment part whenever we are uh, giving the treatment for toxoplasmosis you have to give both the systemic as well as the ocular treatment so if i look at the ocular treatment we have the corticosteroids then along with this we are giving the sulfur triad we have got three sulfur diazine sulfur thiazole and sulfur merazine and uh, this is your three 500 milligram tablets every six hours then along with this we have got the pyrimethamine and um, because you are giving all these drugs so you have to keep a track so you have to do the complete blood count and platelet count also then along with this you have to give the citrovorum factor folinic acid and you have to continue the treatment for four to six weeks now uh, starting the treatment is one aspect and following the treatment is another aspect see whenever you are giving the treatment if you look at the uh, covid treatment also we do uh, start the drugs uh, though we know that starting these drugs is again 
uh, can create a problem and will definitely create a problem if i am giving the steroids that definitely will you know improve the breathing mechanisms but that will again bring up so many other things maybe uh, the uh, blood sugar levels goes high and all the other things but i cannot stop giving the steroids and i cannot give the steroids safely without following so that is the important aspect so similarly whenever they are asking you a question related to the treatment they can ask you that what are the things you are afraid of what are the things that you can do to look a uh, uh, for their uh, screening so uh, whenever i am giving the chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine maybe for the rheumatoid arthritis i cannot give uh, comfortably how uh, uh, for any duration or any dose so we know that what are your toxic doses for daily uh, requirement for your cumulative doses which are toxic and after five years they, are, they can be toxicity so similarly when i am giving these drugs also i have a limitation and i i should know that uh, these are the tests that i have to do all right so these are very very important uh, ones where you can see a uh, macular scarring a typical area of this macular scarring due to the congenital toxoplasmosis you can see and uh, then we have got the heel scars of toxoplasmosis we have got some fresh lesions also we have got the heel lesions also they are also there uh, alternatively what is the other treatment that we can give if you don't want to give that treatment then we can also give the clindamycin and sulfadiazine which is acting synergistically clindamycin you have to give for four weeks and the oral doses of 300 milligram six hourly along with sulfadiazine prescribed as initial loading dose of two gram followed by one gram six hourly then there is a third combination also the third combination is the trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole which is i think uh, a very standard one uh, along with this if you look at the ocular treatment so in the ocular treatment you are going to give the cycloplegics and topical steroids for the anterior segment inflammation systemic corticosteroids should never be used alone without the appropriate antimicrobial treatment this is again very important you have to give the systemic uh, antimicrobial uh, microbials whenever you are giving the corticosteroids also because again there will be a risk of secondary infections if medical measures fail then you have to go for the photocoagulation so this was about your toxoplasmosis now next is your onchocerciasis which is uh, not found in india but this is an infestation which is caused by the onchocerca uh, volvulus and it's a filarial worm now the vector is actually the blood sucking one it's a black fly and uh, it's a similar uh, linear microfilary which are mobile and they are reaching the eyes so um, actually you know uh, we uh, do not get much questions on this because we do not get this in india but you should know the basics and i think you learn the basics in your microbiology also they are causing very very little or no reaction but yes of course when they are dead then they are causing a lot of focal inflammation and there is a destruction of the tissues so what is the type of uveitis that is occurring commonly that is your punctate or sclerosing keratitis with the anterior uveitis and um, we also have a immunological response actually these kind of uh, you know agents are causing a problem by modulating the immune response so they are um, having an immunological response to the lipopolysaccharide of the cell wall of the bacterium along with the volvulus that is a key factor they can be seen in the anterior chamber and uh, if you look at the changes when you look at the choroid the vessels are very very attenuated with a trophy perivascular sheathing optic atrophy all these things are there so fortunately we do not have this in india excision of the worm uh, has to be done a worm containing these nodules and uh, then particularly if these nodules are very very close to the eye you have to remove these nodules because these nodules contains the microfilary and uh, treatment will be by diethyl carb carbamazine which is effective against this microfilary as well as suramen uh, patients however may suffer from a severe adverse reaction if they are heavily infested and then the treatment has to be uh, taken for long that is your 2 to 5 months continuous non pulse delivery of this diethyl carbamazine at a critical low dosage may succeed in killing it without the inflammatory reactions however uh, see in order to kill that microfilary i uh, actually require a lot of amount of this um, uh, dc and uh, you, uh, maybe we are giving it at a low dose but if when you are giving it continuously not even in pulses for such a long duration you can have the unacceptable side effects and in that case you can replace it with the ivermectin and um, 
transmission can be reduced by the uh, larvicidal measures to control the insect vector. So these were again some of the uh, systemic involvements of the uveitis that uh, we had done and I think these are the potential questions that we can get in the form of integrated questions. Keep on enjoying these high sessions of the Parsons, a high textbook of ophthalmology and you will definitely come up with the flying colors. Thanks. Thank you and happy ophthalmology.